Hello, everybody, and welcome to another uh, webinar with the Media Education Lab. Um, so I want to uh, introduce uh, our speaker today, which is very exciting, um, Luke um, Strangberg um, from Brussels. And um, he's going to talk with us about um, the AVI, a new uh, game to identify uh, information. Um, and on person, not saying fake news. So, uh, look, um, take it away and let's walk through like uh, the game and explain the work that you've been doing, how you came to, to this. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, so yeah. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm Luke. I'm from, uh, I'm originally from Australia, um, where I, uh, yeah, I used to work for some NGOs in Australia on digital uh, digital inclusion uh, originally, um, and I somehow ended up in Brussels working for Ayavi. Um, and, and so we've I've, I'm the communications and project officer. Uh, I've been sort of working writing the the blog and built the ARV website and being. Uh, you know, going to lots of different uh, uh, conferences all around, um, all over Europe, which has been really exciting and fun. Um, and just, yeah, trying to uh, work on building up skills on, on, on uh, data visualization as well, but uh, also, yeah, like infographics. So that's how I came to sort of put together the uh, Beyond Fake News infographic and now the game, which is the Beyond the Headlines, so, sort of the second iteration uh, of that. Um, yeah, so that's been really exciting and it's been really good response and it's also been really good with the, the media literacy community uh, helping out with feedback. So we have members individual members and also um, uh, partners throughout Europe and a lot of our members also from the from the states so uh, I you know I sent everyone emails to say here's something I'm working on would you be able to sort of give me a bit of feedback and you know how could we make it better and you know um, so that that was really positive and really good I, I really enjoy the the, the network aspect of, of everyone helping each other out and so you know people will email me now and ask me some questions or I can email them and ask them for favors and, and it's been good and putting people together as well yeah uh, so it's been fun from people for the beyond fake uh, the beyond the headlines game which we first presented just after the conference in Sarajevo where I, I uh, met Renee um, at a workshop here with a, a bunch of people from NGOs in Brussels um, hello <laughs> and uh, and we got people to we shared a bunch of different content and got people to uh, start you know debunking it using both the, the beyond fake news infographic so it's sort of one angle and then the, also using the game, and then uh, so the game, the way the uh, do you want me to explain the way the game works or show us a picture, Luke? Put your screen up and let okay. people see. It. It's hard to uh, it. breaking up. Sure. Yeah, I'll share it. Did that work? Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Beautiful. Okay, so that's the that's on the website where um on the on the website blog, um and it's just got a couple of uh, the instructions and the um, PDF download and a few sort of whoops. Does it work if I scroll down? Yeah. Uh, 
a few sort of examples of, of con more European related uh, content there with the EU versus Disinfo um, group. They're, they're actually right across the road from us in because uh, we're in the center of Brussels around the, the uh, Brussels institutions, um, the European Commission and the, the Parliament and the Council. Uh, the EU versus Disinfo group are actually right next door in the, um, the external action center um, uh, service. So they've been sort of translating all the, the Kremlin dis, disinformation into English and, and then and debunking it with, with uh, just sort of a fact checking angle really, but uh, it's a useful place to get uh, useful website to get resources for um, Kremlin related disinfo. So the way the game works is uh, you start the game with 36 points and then as you go through uh, and check, check your content, uh, you subtract points accordingly. Um, so you analyze the content and then when you get to the bonus round, you can actually add points. Um, and then the bonus question is who owns the, the publication? So uh, once you finish, you can compare. So there's kind of no winners or losers. It's just like who got the most points or who had the best content and, and sort of who had the, the, the least, uh, the content with the least amount of veracity. So, I guess. Like, so Luke, is it like the idea that each student ha is uh, looking at one news article, and so they're, yeah, so they're asking, uh, they're asking, uh, does the headline or maybe website does the headline use all caps or excessive punctuation? Yes or no? And they're sort of self-scoring for their individual article. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, then once they've finished, then they can explain how they got there to their result. So right. that they could, so, yeah. so I could, I could see that that would really be kind of interesting because if a student, if students were like, if, if a student had their own website that they were looking at or their own, uh, news source, right. On a mm -hmm. website, we'd ultimately end up at the end of the game with the high scorers and the high score means good or the high score means bad. The high score um, means good because you're... Ah, so the high scoring would be the quality journal. You're subtracting points as you go along. Right. Yeah. And the low scores would be the junk journalism, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah, so the low score would be junk. Uh, okay. Yeah, high score is good. good. Um, and then... So I mean, you could also use this in in parallel with the Beyond Fake News graphic as well. So we had in our workshop we had groups of about three people each, uh, and, or four people, and so uh, we also had the the uh, the, um, the five questions. The, the five questions and concepts I think I, was, I think I was using the phone your your mobile phone uh, with the five questions so they had a copy of that they had a copy of beyond the headlines and beyond and beyond fake news and then there were two people were using the questions and then pe and two people were going on the on the verification game. Uh, because I think, yeah, the new company is that we're losing contact. Is that okay? No, we hear you. Okay, cool. So yeah, doing the sort of taxonomy with the beyond fake news, um, and then doing yeah, sort of checking, uh, you know, author URL ads, images, and sort of making uh, judgments based on that, and then uh, yeah. And then at the end, they have to explain how they got to their cool. conclusion. Luke, uh, many of the people who are watching this webinar have not seen the uh, Beyond Fake News poster. Can you show that to us yeah. too? No worries. Uh, 
Is that still sharing? On mm -hmm. the... Yep, good. Okay, so that's the Beyond Fake News. Beautiful. I'll, just, I'll open the PDF because it's yeah. a bit bigger. I like the idea that you've designed them to be companion pieces. It's clear that you're thinking about them in relationship to each other. Uh, and you just mm -hmm. said that maybe you thought people would start with the types of fake news, this blue one that we're about mm -hmm. to, we're, that you're pulling this up now. This is a, a very heavy file. So it's loading a little bit. Yeah, the, 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 right? Yeah. So sooner or the later, internet's we're kind of, going to uh, see it, right? Sooner yeah. Or later we're going to see it. But right now, it's still loading a little bit slowly. But the idea is that you <laughs> might start with yeah. this, this one right here, and then yeah. move to the game. Can you talk us through this one in terms of especially your strategy for your use of the color bar and the motivation symbols? Can you talk us through this about, about how you? decided to use that strategy and uh, why? So I guess that's almost, a, it's a sort of gamified uh, way of doing it as, as well, like maybe not as much as the Beyond the Headlines game, uh, but this, this is sort of, it creates an inter interactive and, and point of discussion as well, because uh, uh, I, I would probably, make some changes now that we've uh, used it in 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 classroom context but um yeah so we wanted to i wanted people to discuss the the, the possibility that for instance propaganda could be beneficial um because a lot of people struggle with that concept the idea that you know there can be beneficial propaganda uh so I put neutral there, so and a lot of people. I've had arguments on Twitter with with lots of people who who wanted to, and then I, I normally directed them to the uh, the um, Mind Over Media website and go, if you would like to see some uh, <laughs> you know, examples of of beneficial uh, propaganda, then. The, yeah. Please go here, and I think I have finished change attitudes, values, and knowledge. I think that's one. Of, I think that's my favourite uh, description of, of propaganda that I've that I've seen. So I I, I uh, pitched that one from you. Um, yeah, so so it kind of goes from bad to worse, I guess. So uh, starting with propaganda, then clickbait which you know it can be fun as well it, it doesn't always uh it's not always a negative thing sponsored content um, i think uh you know as long as it's clearly labeled it's, it could be sigit but uh yeah then you have satire which is you know, it's all not always apparent that it's satire and sometimes it's all so yeah, it might not be funny. Um, yeah, going to error. Scroll partisan, down, scroll down. And then I think the I think yeah, also partisan can be really damaging or impact. Yeah. So in in when I was working with the uh, with the other media literacy expert there's a place for opinion opinion content uh but often often partisan you know hyper part damaging uh and and it you know it often it can shift to the uh overton wind uh, Luke, I want to underline uh, the point. I want to underline the point. Acceptable to be pseudoscience. So hold on, that's a really big idea, and I want to unpack that a little bit. I think you just said 
that hyperpartisan news shifts the mm -hmm. Overton window to make unacceptable uh, ideas uh, acceptable. That's the point you just made, right? Uh oh. It's happened a lot. We uh, we've we've cut out. A little bit. Yeah, I think. It, I mean. Now. Okay, uh, I, I think it's happened a little bit. For instance, in, in Australia, where, where I'm from, the, uh, there are populist parties who, who, have, who have introduced, uh, you know, sometimes hateful uh, ideas into, into the national discussion and has, and it, and has made it... Okay, they've made it okay in a way. They've shifted the, the window of what's acceptable to discuss. In some ways, that, that you could imagine that that could be a good thing, but in this case, it's, it's shifted the Overton window to the far right. right. And, uh, and, it's, and it's made form, some forms of speech I think more acceptable in public discourse and so that's that's my I guess everyone's worry about uh, hyper partisan content uh, is that what you were looking for like uh, yeah absolutely I, I appreciate that clarification because I think when I first saw your chart I was quibbling about where your colors were and what why your colors what was the rationale behind your colors? Because uh, I wouldn't have thought partisan news was so dangerous, but you've just given me a very good re uh, reasoning why, you, why it might be long in the color marked uh, medium or orange. So mm -hmm. I think it is, I think like you said, the. Uh, thinking through the relative impact of these forms of news is a place of discussion, right? Uh, using yeah. evidence like what you just shared and reasoning like what you just shared, uh, that's, a, I think, a really exciting way that this infographic could be used. Yeah, 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 I agree. So, yeah, um, and I, I, I should say also none of these uh, types can be seen in isolation to any of the others because a piece of partisan content might have a clickbait headline and it also might be a piece of propaganda for, for uh, an organisation or a political party and it also might be a conspiracy theory, it might be pseudoscience, it might be, yeah. Right. Now, can you explain to us why you decided to use the motivation legend and yeah. what does that mean over there in the corner? Money, politics, humor, passion, and misinformation. How, what, what's your understanding of that part of the graphic? What does it mean to you? Um, so, yeah, we, we, would, we were trying to think of what are the main motivations. So, again, these are, are points of discussion because, you know, maybe uh, students, they might disagree. So they might uh, they go oh propaganda no it's all, it's all about money as well and uh, it's just because we didn't add the the euro symbol next to all you know every single one of the types of, of uh, content it doesn't mean money is not also uh, you know money is totally a motivation of all types of of all these types of content it all, it's always going to be there. But maybe it's not always the the driving force. So for propaganda, we we put uh, politics and power and passion also. Um, the clickbait, you know, it's we consider that to be you know money, but also uh, it could be fun and humorous. Um, so the, yeah, that's how we kind of came to the conclusion. And then error, we put inform, so misinform or inform. So you know, established news organisations try to inform people, but occasionally they make errors. So 
that's uh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's they're there. The impact and motivation are supposed to be debated in a way. People should be be allowed to disagree with with what we put there. I think, and uh, yeah, it could create create a lot of. I think it's there to for people to really start thinking about it and, and what what are the motivations, how bad is you know what what kind of negative or positive impacts can can these different uh, things have yeah I think uh, Shahana, did you have a question? Uh, so I just I like well, you're I was just thinking, first of all, I actually used this particular table for my class and I'm so happy right now I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm part of a project and uh, they came up with these websites and news materials and made a project to talk about why it's fake on the basis of this and they came up with much more of it and I was so happy and I'm going to go and tell them that I spoke to you. But while we're at it, I... Through this whole project, what I realized and what my students, all of us realized is, you know, if I look at partisan, uh, so from an Indian perspective, um, there are these, so in, in the southern part of India, in, in Tamil Nadu, there are these channels uh, like Sun TV and Jaya TV. And both these TVs are actually, the ownership goes to the two main political parties. And the way the news is broadcasted, it depends on how they can uh, bring the either party up, you know, in, in, in public opinion. So when we talk about things like, and they do garner some sort of messages which would create some sort of a hate crime between a certain uh, religion or caste and things like that. So, you know, from medium in, in Indian context, it becomes like a high impact scenario because uh, if you look at Gujarat riots also, yeah. That's one of the reasons. In fact, we very it's 15 recently, hours. yeah. So very recently, we came across this website, and this website very openly calls itself the anti-secular uh, views, and it has news which is very one-sided, and the facts are all wrong. But it is legitimately running itself on the website, and people are following it. Every right-wing person is following that, and it is creating animosity between Hindus and the Muslims further and further or rather the majority. So it becomes like a, so the question I had was sometimes probably, I think situationally and uh, otherwise the, the color impact might uh, have, you know, I mean, might change. Like what I was thinking, like, you know, in the case of high impact in our case, the kind of uh, situation, I mean, if I understood it right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you cut, it cut out for a second there. Can you say the la last part again? I missed it. So, I sorry. mean, I was just wondering that in the case of partisan and in the case of the kind of example that mm -hmm. I just talked about in India, it the color impact could have a difference depending on the kind of situation uh, or... or uh, yeah, totally. You know, like, I, I, I definitely think... Yeah, I agree. Like, it, it, I definitely think there are certain types of partisan news which are, are really, really damaging. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I also, I mean, I try, I, I try to be a good media literate citizen and, and try to burst my own uh, oh, yeah, that's true. bubble. And, and sometimes that's I read that's... things like uh, that I, I completely disagree with, like, uh, like um, I don't know, Reason Magazine, for instance, which is a libertarian. Oh kind of thing, I, I can't stand it, but I, I still try to read it. Or like Jacobin, which is a, a yeah. communist, basically a communist uh, uh, magazine. So I think there's a place always for opinion, uh, opinion pieces. Um, so on base, on base of that, I'm interested, and again, you shared a little bit. So how do you come to create this infographics? So obviously I can see the benefits and Shahana just share how she used it in her class. I'm um, taking that and going to teach it next um, semester when I have uh, a news literacy class. And I'm wondering, 
Um, if you can share with us a little bit behind the scene of like how it came to be the game and these infographics, like from your perspective of producing it. Yeah, um, I guess it, it took a while. I, I, I didn't want to, when this sort of, uh, yeah, the whole last year and, and all the events of the last year and I didn't want to do something straight away. I didn't feel quite confident in a way to, to build something like this. So I sort of waited and, and kept th trying to think about it and, and learn more and, and, and uh, until I felt you know, confident that I could make something like this. Um, and I saw some other sort of similar efforts to do, to do similar things. Um, for instance, uh, the, uh, what's their name? I think there was a library in Oklahoma, I think. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, and then is it IFRA? No, uh, if international library association, um, they did something and then first draft news, they did some quite cool things. Um, and then also there's the news literacy. Uh, I think there's two organizations and they did, they did like a beyond the headlines thing, but it's, it's uh, so I, I tried to sort of look at that and then look at other questions. And then I wanted to make it into a game. I wanted to make it quite, quite fun. And that, that was the, that was challenging with the beyond the headlines. It was, was trying to turn it into a, because so you, you can, you knew already you wanted to do a game because first came this one and then mm -hmm. came the game. So you knew already it was like a, a way that you really did. Yeah, it was kind of a, it was, a, that was part of the plan. The plan is it was actually to have a third one um, as well, Ooh. which was, which, yeah, I, I'll, it might be a while in the making because I'm actually, uh, I'm, leaving a Yavi uh, next week actually <laughs> to go work in um, uh, at the Center for Media Freedom in, in, uh, in Florence in Italy. But um, the, the third one was going to be more of uh, like be, uh, beyond the rhetoric and it, and it was looking at the at different kind of like, uh, logical fallacies and then I was going to grab a bunch of content that used potential log logical fallacies or bad arguments mm -hmm. and and then so people could see you know what's a straw man argument mm -hmm. and then you then you have six, some examples sure. and then people are like oh that that's a straw man argument and blah 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 so that was going to be the third got it iteration. i get it so then in a way if you're you were thinking all along from macro to micro with yeah, that, yeah, this one, the blue one being the macro, and then can you flip to the middle one uh, beyond the headlines now, Luke? Yeah. So then, this one beyond the headlines is kind of uh, more granular, and then beyond the rhetoric is really looking within a particular message, right? So yeah. I get that idea of um, uh, this one. This one is still looking holistically at the entire content. Whereas the next one that you might make is looking within the language, the construction of the language and the argument within at the yeah. argument level. What a yeah. cool idea. I hope you get to make all three. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a red hot go, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll have to ask you guys for some feedback, I think. <laughs> sure, sure. sure. What, I, what, I, what I think is really interesting about this one, and I'm really looking forward, like Yanti, I'm looking forward to trying this one out with my uh, students. I haven't used the Beyond the Headlines uh, yet, is I really like the idea of the game function, right? Yeah. And uh, to me, that seems really uh, curious and interesting, and I think adds a certain fun value to it. Of course, it's great to have the concepts, right? And especially yes. displayed so beautifully visually in such an interesting way, um, but the uh, the assignment of points is just a it's a stroke of genius. 
right? It's really, Thank really you. good. <laughs> Thanks. But it, it, it was hard to do. It, this was, was something I was like, oh, um, how do we assign the points? And, you know, is, are people going to get upset with me because I gave this one one point and this one three points or something? So it's, it's yeah, it was kind of a leap of faith. But, but everyone's feedback was great. That, that was the, the valuable thing was to have other people in the community, usually who I've met through Twitter, um, to help to help make decisions about that. So can you can you share that process? How did you build it? Like, did you build it from your like research? How was the feedback process? What tool did you use to produce it? Even uh, I used Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator. Um, and but the, fir the I think the first couple of iterations, I just did a mock up on paper and just wrote things. Uh, the, the first on beyond the headlines, I think I had, I mean, what there's three points for each type. It, uh, that, that was originally five points. And I thought well, this, this infographic has too much info. So <laughs> I, I, I eventually somehow just, I, I think I made the whole one with like five points and then I was like, no, 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 this is too much. And it's, it's confusing and it's, uh, you know, exhausting to look at. So I just thought, no, I'll, bro I'll do my best to try and break it down to the core. Um, and, the, and, and also the try to be economic with the words because, uh, yeah, the, each each uh, point was had made way more words in it, and uh, and then I, I just worked and worked until I could just, um, get it down to the core and extract the kind of useless information. So, Luke, can I ask you a critical question? Mm -hmm. So, J J Yanti asked you about how the thing, how you made it, and you, and basically you started with all, a lot of ideas. And you collapse down to you know the smallest you could get on this big piece of paper. I have a different question mm -hmm. um, because when I read your bullet points, I feel like there's an ideology here. Yeah. <laughs> and the ideology is uh, mainstream media is better mm, than yeah. other sources of information. It's, it's an appeal and to an authority. Academic, I feel really insulted by that, you know, because mm -hmm. it's almost like you're teaching people that uh, presenting information the way we used to do in the 20th century is superior to those of us who are bloggers or uh, academics or even partisans. Yeah. Is it is, is are, are you overtly uh, uh, communicating an ideology that mainstream media is more trustworthy than other sources of information? Yeah, that's one of the things I, I struggled with after I did it and I went, oh, there is definitely an ideology here, which is, and it's also, it's an appeal to authority, which is also a logical fallacy. Um, so yeah, I, I want to revise again and, and think about how we can um, avoid that in future because I yeah the I mean the traditional gatekeepers have have their their place but but I don't want to give them you know too much authority in this respect and uh, yeah I agree right yeah. right my other comment about this particular piece is the way you use the term verification I wonder what you mean by that so you call this the online news verification game. When you use the word verification, what do you mean by it? Yeah, that could also be maybe a misnomer because, uh, for instance, yeah, the, uh, I mean, checking, checking for stylistic uh, things aren't really verification, are they? So, um, if if it's a stock image or if the ads are, are gross looking that's doesn't really verify the whether the information is is uh, is good information or not it's more of a aesthetic 
Um, yeah, so yeah, verification, I guess it's just to, I guess uh, maybe we rushed through with the title. <laughs> well, I think, I think the idea of what you're verifying, these, this criteria, these criteria are, you're verifying that it comes from a professional news organization, right? So you're helping students recognize the difference between something that comes from the New York Times or from the Guardian mm -hmm. and recognize that's different than what comes from a blogger or an academic or a, a, a partisan. So there's really a, there's really a value to that because often I, I have found students do not recognize that distinction. Right? Yeah, no, so it's true. Figures, I mean, I think, I think this can be very helpful, right? Because they might not have noticed how subconsciously the images or the ads are shaping their idea about the professionalism of the world. Yeah, yeah. but um, back on the authority tip, I do think there are, that uh, there are um, like editorial oversight is an important um, aspect of, of information and, and, and knowing that an organization has had some sort of editorial oversight, that I think that matters to me a bit. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, if you're doing a research paper and you quote, uh, you know, freedomain.fake.co or something, I don't think, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's you might quote it as an example of bad information, but you wouldn't necessarily quote it in, you know, as a resource for your, um, of, of good information for your uh, you know, essay or something. Right, and sort of from my point of view, one of the things that distinguishes news from other genres, and that's what I kind of, I was really interested about how you see these pieces working together, right? Because one of the characteristics of news that, is unique to the genre is the use of interviews with experts who are quoted directly on the record, right? So how do I judge a quality news source is it says, according to name of expert, title of expert. Yeah. Quote. So here you don't call that out as a particular feature that would help to verify the quality of information. So I'm kind of curious, like, why did you leave that out? Um, in the- Ah, you do, it's in it, the bonus it's, it's, round. It's at the bottom, yeah, it's a, uh, <laughs> yeah. Cool. It is a, uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, I've thought about it a lot since making this. Also, the, uh, there was some study I read the other day where they got historians and uh, academics and, uh, and then fact checkers to verify information. And the fact checkers, they used like heuristics, like, uh, you know, shortcuts. Mm -hmm. So they were much quicker. And also they just went str straight away. If the first thing they did was just go off the site and start searching in Google. And the historians and the the other students and academic, they didn't. They stayed on the site and and looked at the. So the I think one of the and I'd like to emphasise that I think more in a, in a in a second iteration of this is just going away from the content and searching and doing the work, and and I think it's for some people it's, it's it can be really quick. Like for a fact checker, they can do this quite quickly. But for other people, it's more of a labor, like, you know, it takes a, it takes a while to, uh, to, to verify it by going off the site. And sure. searching. Well, I think you communicate that really nicely by the big number of points you award for the bonus question at the bottom. Can you find out how, who owns the publication? So yeah. you, you create a reward structure there for them going off of the source to explore uh, more deeply or to find other pages that support that. So I do think you are, you're getting at that idea of, um, you know, doing more research. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks. 
No, thanks also for the feedback as well. I'll, I'll, um, it'd be good to review this in, in sort of six months' time and, and uh, to think about how it could be improved. It's really a cool, it's a really cool um, project. Of course, for, from, from my point of view, the idea of using infographics to um, develop curriculum material, I mean, to my knowledge, are, uh, Jonathan and Shahana, are you aware of anybody else who's done infographics as a form of curriculum material? No, Luke, you are the first. <laughs> Which is what cool. I was looking for when in my, so I was doing it from the perspective of development communication reporting and I was looking for so much of this and then I came across this and I had to like take it as a printout and explain them what it is. But there's just one thing that while we were doing this project, I forgot to mention, you know, so we deal with uh, print journalism as well as online journalism. And, you know, sometimes in print, we were trying to use this for print as well because what happens is all these print newspaper i mean the the newspapers they also have all the paid news and all of that happening which we don't often understand if we are not journalists or at least not studying communication uh so if you sometimes i remember when monsanto had come to india uh, they started talking about how oh, villages in India, suddenly these pictures of villages in India in the newspaper, and they are so happy and the farmers are happy. And for a second, I felt, wow, the farmers in India are happy. No one is talking about the suicides that are happening every month. No one is talking about them. They're showing this happy picture. Then I see, uh, then I go to Times of India page, uh, I, I go to their annual report to see where their money is coming from. And then I see Monsanto is one of that because there they are supposed to disclose it. Now that becomes a paid news, but then no one is going to do the kind of research I did because I am a communication student and you know, they are not, and they're going to just buy it at the face value because Times of India is one of the best, uh, the highly circulated newspapers in India. So I was, I mean, this was a great uh, infographic for me to teach students to even begin talking about fake news. And that's the reason why very recently I even tweeted about it, like how important it is, because uh, especially with the kind of political ideology uh, we are going through right now in our country. So I think this is a very good beginning. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I want... Thanks. I want to tackle on that and ask you, Luke, about if you can share some stories. You said you got a lot of uh, feedback and people responding through Twitter. So how did you use social media to not only to publicize and advance the spread of, of this curriculum and in this game, but also to get feedback for your own and kind of communicate it? So if you can share some experience you had. Um, so uh, one thing is I, I set up uh, uh, the IAVI individual members Facebook group. Um, so we have a, on, on the website, we have people can sign up and then we encourage them to join the Facebook group. And then I, um, so I was sharing content on the Facebook group and just sort of asking, you know, what, what do you think of this? And uh, also, we, we, we attached a, a Google document to the top, pinned it to the top of the group so that it was just a com completely open document so that people could contribute and put ideas and links and things in there. Um, so that was, that was good. And then also, the, some of the members don't use the group too much, so I, I just emailed them. Um, so that, that, that was helpful. And then... Yeah, Twitter, I think uh, Twitter was just, it was great for disseminating it. And also I mean, Facebook was too, but uh, it's really hard to get engagement through Facebook. It's a bit sad sometimes. We make all this content for them for free and then they don't share it for us. Um, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> but... Um, uh, so yeah, the, that that was handy. Tw Twitter was Twitter was useful, but yeah, that that was when when I f more when I finally finished it and then shared it, and then uh, then we had to have yeah, 
um, arguments and you, you're forced to think about the ways that people might have misunderstood or, or they didn't, you know, yeah. Wow. Boy, there's a lot there to unpack. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for asking that really good question. And, and Luke, I'm really excited to hear how you used your network in the development process to invite feedback, right? I think that's a really cool, the idea of the open Google Doc here, you know, comment on this document. It's a kind of uh, relatively easy way to get uh, immediate feedback uh, at, for a work in progress. Um, and even if only one or two or three people engage in that, you're still taking into consideration how the thing is interpreted, right? Yes. Um, but are you saying, did you just say that some people misinterpreted the uh, two infographics that you created and they totally didn't get it? Can you tell us more about that? That seems bizarre. All right, so I'll go back to the, the first one. So people had, uh, whoops, people had more issue with uh, this one. Is that still sharing? Yeah. You need to go back down to the green box and do, yeah. That's it. Uh, so uh, conspiracy theory, this stuff is so loaded. I mean, the conspiracy <laughs> theories, people get so upset and the, you know, it's, it's like there are misinformed people and uninformed people and misinformed people kick back and dig in much more than uninformed people. So. Uh, I think you know people really hold on to conspiracy theories as well. Like it's a way of explaining, as I said in the graphic, it's a it's a way to simply explain complex things and uncertainty. And I have a lot of friends back home in Australia who subscribe to conspiracy theories, and uh, and I think it's as a way of explaining. You know, I mean, I, I come from a, it's a neighborhood that is, it's quite, uh, it's been economically sort of, it hasn't gotten any better. In fact, it's getting much worse. And it might be a way to explain why people's lives aren't improving and things like this. So it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it, it, that's my opinion anyway. But uh, someone, someone said on Twitter that the uh, molotov ribbentrop uh, pact was a conspiracy theory and then it was proven uh, to be true and I was like okay so that I mean you, you've got a point but I'm not trying to sit we're not trying to suggest that uh, no conspiracy theories have ever have ever come true it's right. just that though, that uh, yeah those those times when they have uh, been found to be true are the exceptions that prove the the rule because there's so few but um so that was yeah that was one of the arguments we had and then i think someone said how do you know that snake oil is doesn't have some <laughs> <laughs> healing properties I was like, okay. <laughs> and they were and they were being serious so <laughs> got it got it <laughs> so, so where so where people uh, talked back on Twitter was about the uh, pseudoscience and the conspiracy theory, which you know a, a fair number of people feel kind of emotionally attached to. Yeah, I think so. I think hmm. yeah, fascinating. Totally. Yeah, uh, that's why I think. I mean, your your efforts as well to teach the conspiracies. That's that's really noble because it's, I, I think it's really hard to do because as soon as you introduce people to it, uh, they, they become interested in it in the way that you don't want them to, <laughs> perhaps. Right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, I think it's a, I think it's really difficult and I think it's where a lot of um, pop, populism is, is grabbing hold of people's imaginations and yeah. 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 In fact, maybe conspiracies should be the worst, which be <laughs> because they live beyond the fake news. Fake news stories get debunked. So the Pope endorses Donald Trump. You can debunk that, and then, and then of course, 
you know, maybe some people still believe it, but in general, it doesn't live beyond like Pizzagate lived, you know, and, and also conspiracy theories are really dangerous when you look at Pizzagate because that was an actual episode of violence that led yep. to an episode of yep. uh, violence. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. your distinction, you're doing a distinction between conspiracy theory and fake news because Pizzagate was referred to as fake news for many people mm -hmm. um, and not but I think that it is a conspiracy theory. Yeah. It became a conspiracy theory. Yeah, because I see, yeah, at first, at first it was probably someone on 4chan and made it up and then it became, and it grew, it grew legs because yeah. conspiracy theories also have sub conspiracies attached to them. Yeah. So, for instance, the, I saw like John John Podesta was is was the father, the illegitimate father of Chris Cornell or something, and that's why Chris Cornell is <laughs> is committed suicide. So it's like this, you know, it's like sub. They have a longer shelf life, and they they create little sub conspiracies yeah. you know, even after being yeah yeah. Even so, so the idea that conspiracy theories grow to be an alternative world view, yeah, right. So that it's not just a particular piece of information; it's a whole, uh, you know, constellation of ideas that relate to, and that's a much, that's a very robust, an alternative a world view goes way beyond the scope of, um, of this. But it also, interestingly, happens on the left and the right. Yeah, definitely. Right. So Especially I think that's probably what's powerful about this chart, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, yeah, the pseudoscience stuff can you see a lot on the left as well. Yeah. Um, and and so and sometimes the people who subscribe to these things don't realize that it's coming actually from a partisan um, perspective. So for people who might subscribe to um, uh, uh, what's his name, Alex Jones. And his uh, mm. deep state uh, conspiracies and things. They, they, I'm not sure that they really realise that that he's a right wing libertarian. You know <laughs> that there's this ideology behind. Them, you know, and and some of those people who do subscribe to it, who are whom I know from from back home, they're they're quite left wing people. It was like they would. If, if you press them, they would say, yeah, I believe in this and this and, you know, but then they're following these conspiracy theories who are, or theorists. Right. Um, who are, yeah. Isn't that right. fascinating? Yeah. So I think it's, it's where, I think where, this is where history is important as well, is understanding political ideology and the, you know, and the 20th century, you know, with, you know, communism and neoliberalism and, and things like this. I think that's important because it gives context. Cool. Um, so we're coming to like the, the end of the webinar. What I want to do like for the, the last couple of minutes before we, we end is kind of uh, share with us, Luke, so what is the new place you're going? And like for you personally, after doing this and getting so much, you know, uh, attention about the success of those infographics and game and, um, what is your like next thing to do and, and how is that connected as your path? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm, so I'm moving to uh, Florence. It's the Center for Media Pluralism and, and, and Freedom. Um, it's, a, it's at the European University Institute, which is an institute set up by the European Commission. And uh, they have the School of Regulation and, and so they do, it's a, it's a postgraduate university. Uh, so ma mainly PhDs and researchers doing study on, um, on, a, on you know, economics or, or communications, uh, which is what I'm, I'll be doing. Uh, and they have this remit from, from the European Commission to do this uh, at the CMPF, to do a, Every year is a study on monitoring media pluralism in in Europe. So monitoring 
changes in ownership and threats to freedom, uh, censorship, um, yeah, all, all the kind of things that, that could destabilize the union as well. So, uh, and we have the here the 2019 uh, European elections are coming up. So, a lot of the ministers of the European Parliament are quite threatened by what could could happen uh, with a lot of the populist parties and, and misinformation. And yeah, that's been spreading. So. Yeah, it's kind of a, it'll be an interesting, it's a different thing for me to do because I'll be looking, I'll be putting the data together for the monitor uh, as a research assistant. Um, and I'll be helping to develop the, the Centre for Media Pluralism and Freedoms uh, website. And uh, yeah, so. Wow. I won't, I won't be able to be as creative, I don't think, but I, I think it's, I'm going to learn a lot uh, and um, I'm so, so excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So we wish you uh, good luck and thank you so much for sharing with us um, those two pieces that we, we love and we use and appreciate uh, very, very much. Now I'm so happy that you guys use it. It's, it's awesome. I'm really happy. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Sure. Thank you, Luke. It was great learning with you today. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.